So when my mom died, uh, I thought, well, this is over. She's not there anymore. And still, I went to say goodbye to her and, and, and everything. Two days later, we are at home. And I'm leaving my bed. She, we, she was very quickly cremated. My father didn't want to organize anything uh, fancy at all. And uh, he was really very pragmatic, like, let's get you know, through this. Over, yeah. Let's get over it. So we put the ashes in, in my place, in my room. Middle of the night, there's, there's a, a painting that flies from one part to the other side of the room. Wow. Bomb. And uh, next morning, I, I went to see and, you know, find out what happened. But I couldn't find any logical exp explanation. Moreover, this has never happened before. Mm. And, uh, and uh, the nails were still on the wall. <laughs> Welcome to Mind the Shift. I am Anders Bolling. In this episode, we're going to talk about uh, burnout, meditation, running, near-death experiences, Mexico, Holland, and a lot of other things. I am here in Amsterdam with my dear friend and podcast colleague, Gabriela Guzman Sanabria. Welcome to the show, Gabriela. Hi, thank you, Anders. Um, thank you for having me, for inviting me. It's my pleasure. Uh, and I hope that we won't hear, there, there's a lot of traffic outside the hotel here, but hopefully this microphone does its job, so we won't, we won't hear that. Um, yeah, I was blessed yesterday to be invited to your home, and uh, your lovely and your ta and very talented seven-year-old daughter, she spoke an excellent English with me. And then with you and your husband, she kind of seamlessly switched between Dutch and Spanish. So your little family is, is truly um, a, a dream for all of us who, who are longing for global integration. So you're not originally here from, from Holland, you're from Mexico. So tell us, how, for how long have you lived here? And, and, and how what's, I the, came to what's here. the story? <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, I think, uh, well, it's true. I think my family uh, structure really reflects my dreams when I was young. Uh, I was born in Mexico City in 1973. And uh, uh, from a very young age, I had this feeling, and we will come back to this, mm -hmm. that uh, the world was very big. There were many languages. There were lots of kind of people and that I wanted to travel and uh, and talk other languages. So my parents, they, uh, they sent me to a bilingual school. That's why I, I learned uh, English. I told you that in Mexico, every, you know, people don't have lessons at school that are, especially when not you're very young. So it was quite special to go to a bilingual school. And, uh, and in this way, I also wanted to raise uh, my daughter. Mm. So she would speak more languages. Uh, so when I was uh, about uh, the age of, I think it was well, like 10 or 12, I really decided I wanted to travel. But of course, I was too young. And uh, my parents would, would take us to America sometimes for, for a trip. Uh, but that was it. Mm. It was Mexico or the United States. And so I, st I, I told my parents, I'm, I want to have a job and I'm going to save money to go abroad. And as soon as I can, I'm going to go to Europe because that's the old continent. That's where more, more knowledge is. I mean, I've been mm -hmm. sometimes in America and I thought, well, I've seen this. I want to see something else. And So uh, that's the reason why you chose uh, Europe. Yeah. Was the feeling that this is, there's, that's where the knowledge is. Yeah, the old continent. And I would, of course, I want to see uh, Greece, you know, where everything, the, the, uh, Occidental Western society and culture started. Mm. Uh, so my first job in Mexico was at the fitness center. I love to sport. I love to run, and uh, and it was helping there. And we and I I saved money for about five years to be able to travel to Europe. And you were very young when you saved that money. Yeah, I started when I was fifteen. Yeah. I started working fifteen. I was just fifteen years old. And when I was 19, I had the money 
and uh, and I came to Europe to travel. That's great. Yeah. But it seems, I mean, many people don't, don't know much about Mexico, but I think people have this idea. People in Europe have this idea that it's a very poor country and all that. But it seems to me that your family, your upbringing was fairly affluent. I mean, you had, your family had the money to go to the United States for holiday and so on. So did it, was it a more or less affluent family you brought up in? Well, I think I, I would say my, my family was uh, middle class. Okay. What is that middle class <laughs> like middle class in, in, the, in Europe or is it something different? Uh, I think it was middle class in Mexico. Mm. Uh, my father is a doctor. And my mother was not working, but I think my family was also middle class and giving, you know, you can always de- make the wise decisions and invest your money in what, what's culture and, and knowledge mm-hmm. and uh, school. So we didn't have much luxury, but what was very uh, important to my parents was that we would have a bilingual school and that we would see some well, like abroad. So we we would go to the United States, but we didn't have the money to travel to Europe. That mm. was too too expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so how come you opted for, for the Netherlands? I mean, there are many countries in this on this old continent. Yeah. That's a good question. It was a kind of coincidence, but well, coincidence. There are no coincidences. There are no coincidences, <laughs> indeed. And uh, my urge to go abroad and to even live abroad was so big that um, when I came here to travel, uh, one of the cities I saw was Amsterdam. I visited Amsterdam and I fell in love with it. Mm. I felt, wow, it's like a, it's like a city, but it's also a village. Mm. And Dutch people go everywhere by bike. So that is also something I fell in love with, yeah. going by bike and traveling. Uh, it's flat, it's rainy. It's for me was completely strange. I have never spoke Dutch, so I thought this this is great. And of course, the, the great painters Van Gogh, you mm. know. Uh, um, so I went back to Mexico with a plan. I thought I have to go back, and when I go back, I will stay. So I uh, chose also the Netherlands because I wanted to become or an artist of uh, study graphic design, and there was quite a lot of opportunity at that moment. It was mm. the 1990s, 1993. And uh, and Holland was known because of graphic design, yeah, typ- typographic and graphic design. So I sent my I, I I worked very hard for a year. I sent my work, photographs and designs and everything I've made to the to the academies to The Hague and Amsterdam and Rotterdam, and I was admitted at The Hague, which is I heard it was like very. Uh, singular, yeah. Okay. Because there were two hundred people waiting outside, and only seventy were admitted. Oh, so you were very talented. I mean, no, no wonder your daughter is that talented. She, her daughter, showed me also her paint, her drawings yesterday, and they were very good. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it she's comes talented, from her yeah. mother. So well, it was uh, uh, what you say. Coincidence? There are no actually. Uh, I also met. Through my father, he had friends, uh, uh, doctors in, in, you know, all around the world. Mm. And one of these persons uh, happened to, to be a doctor uh, who's, and, and I felt even with, a, have a relationship, a sentimental relation with family of her. For a while, her family helped me a lot when I was in Holland because I was alone. Mm. I was 20 years old and I was alone. Um, it didn't work. I finished my studies and I had, at that moment, I could just uh, decide to stay or leave. So I left back, I went back to Mexico actually for a year and I didn't, I couldn't stay there anymore. Mm. I decided to come back. What was it about Mexico that you didn't really like? Yeah, that's uh, indeed a very good question. And this, um, I love Mexico myself. <laughs> yeah, <you know? laughs> I haven't been there for a long time. but Yeah, people always ask me in Holland, what are you doing here? Yeah, it's rainy. It's it's not sunny. It's I know Mexicans have come here and have left with a depression because you know, you know it's uh, today is yeah. a very shiny. Well, that's not particularly day. Dutch. I mean, that's, this weather is West European general West European weather. So. Yeah, <laughs> it's really bad weather. Weather yeah, in the Netherlands, yeah, yeah. but 
I think um, when I was in Mexico, I had many nightmares about, there was nightmares about destruction. Mm -hmm. And I had always the feeling that I was not safe. Um, and that was about the negative part of it. Also a negative part of it was uh, being a woman in Mexican society. I felt, uh, well, my, 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 my dad and my mom, they were very open-minded, but I think the society in general really have, I had the feeling I was put in a place I didn't want to be. Mm. So it was a struggle. Always, every day when you walk on the street, when you want to have a job, when you have uh, even friends or a boyfriend, there's always a struggle. Mm. Um, and you, um, I feel limited. And I thought I want to be in a society when I feel free, just to try out mm -hmm. and to see how far I can go. And I guess that you can experience here in, in Holland and in, and in Western Europe in general. Yeah. If you're a woman, particularly, I think yeah. it might be exactly. And I was very used to um, to be alone. It was something we will talk about later, I guess. But I, when I came to Holland, I was alone. I felt like at home. I felt like finally. I can be the person I want to be. And nobody's going to ask me, are you married? Do you have children? Nothing. I can be just the way I want to be. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons I, I, I left Mexico. And uh, I mean, when I go back now, it's like uh, I can, maybe I've, I've changed. So now I will have many less problems than before with people who asking me if you're married, you're not married, whatever, yeah. you know. Now mm. I don't care anymore. Mm. But at that moment, I felt like struggled. You know, I was like strangled by society. And I, uh, my, all my friends said, you're crazy. Mm. You're not. <laughs> yeah. Your friends in Mexico? Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. Even my father said, well, I mm. don't understand your choice, but just. Yeah. But you go there every, every year? Just, yeah. If, if you can. Yeah, I, I try to go and every you meet year. Yeah. friends and family. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That's yeah. good then. Well, so you came here in the 90s and you, uh, you, you began working with this or you studied uh, graphic design and started working with that. And then you also did a lot of sports, athletics, running, all other kinds of sports or running was your thing? Yeah, running is, uh, has been always. I mean, later yeah. on, I tried also start triathlon. So I've also been swimming and biking. Um, and I must tell the audience that, that Gabriella does the marathon on three hours and 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Yeah. Yes, that's very <laughs> impressive. We yeah. have to say that. Yeah, I was uh, very, very um, passionate about sport. I'm still very passionate about sport. Yeah. And uh, that also kept me away from um, from bad things. Yeah. You know? I mean, when you're alone and uh, you really feel very far from home. And that those days, I mean, you know, there was no internet. You couldn't just... No. Phoning was very expensive. So you were young. And yeah, you're young. I mean, it can go wrong. I mean, it's yeah. Amsterdam, you know, there, there are, there's a lot of things going uh, on. But I was always in a, this healthy mood, you know, like, mm. no, no, no. I'm going out, I'm going running, mm. and then healthy eating and, and, and yeah, going to bed not so, so late. And I mean, the art academy, it's also a place for you don't have the healthiest habits, you know, going to sleep very late at night. And everybody smokes, everybody drinks wine and beer all the time. And, and all kinds of drugs, drugs I saw around. <laughs> yeah, this is the place for, for that kind of thing as well. It's the famous coffee shops. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, but no, I was not interested. So uh, also running and sports in general has kept me uh, quite healthy. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. But your podcast, the name of your podcast is Escape from the Burnout Society, which tells us that something happened here. I mean, I also should say that we, we got to know each other when we were developing our podcasts in parallel, you and I. So uh, that's how, it start, how our friendship started. But um, Escape from the Burnout Society, why, why this theme? There is something here. Can you tell us what, what happened? Yeah, well, uh... When I finished the studies, my studies in, in graphic design, I uh, work as a designer and uh, uh, it, it was like a dream come true. Uh, then all of a sudden everything went online. 
so graphic design was not more uh, painting and making photographs and it was more like copy paste mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I decided no this is not anything for me I don't want to only copy paste things and um, there was part there was always some space for creative uh, development but mm. uh, I decided well I'm going to study communication so I spent four years at the university uh, in, in Amsterdam but when I finished there was very little work. I mean, we had a crisis. It was a worldwide crisis at that moment. Back and then, in 2007. Yeah. yeah. And then my life started to change. This dream in, in Europe, when I had my studies, I was independent and I could do whatever I wanted. Then suddenly there was a crisis and I was in a minority. I mean, I don't have a family here. I have uh, just very few friends. And then I was looking for a job and competing with uh, hundreds of thousands of Dutch people who were wanted the same job as I. Yeah. So I didn't. I, I worked here and then with a project or two. So I ended up somewhere else. Uh, I got a little bit depressed in those years because I couldn't find a, the the what I wanted to do. So I ended doing thing, other things I didn't like to do. Mm. But at a certain point, sport again saved me. And uh, there was a big company who were looking for leaderships, uh, you know, leaders, yeah. managers. And I thought, well, let's try that. Why not? Mm. I mean, communication is also interpersonal communication. Exactly. I also I learned about leadership at the university. So I took the job. and uh, But it was a very demanding job, physically, mentally. And it, uh, I think the, the first uh, three, four years were okay, uh, but it, it it was it was a big, big uh, transnational, and we had many managers, and there was a lot of issues going around, and um, and I was still very passionate. I liked what I was doing, but uh, at a certain point, I got burned out. Mm. And being someone has that has run marathons. And at that moment, I already had to some did some triathlons. I was surprised myself. I thought, how? You're, this... I'm immune to this. I can never burn out because yeah, yeah I'm so healthy. I'm so healthy. And everybody was amazed. My colleagues, even my husband was also amazed. My friends. How can you get burned out? Yeah. And uh, because, I mean, I told you I was... I could be a little bit depressed, but it's not really a depression. It was more like a, sometimes I would have a dip or I would feel like, well, it's not, I'm not very happy today. But being in a burn, it was like a black hole, you know, mm. and, and I was not depressed, but I was very, um, I was very negative about, about the future because you discover that you are very healthy. You do the best to be uh, healthy. And then suddenly you cannot move from that you're you're bedridden for for almost like three months hmm. yeah i was going to ask ask about that how, how does it show i mean what kind of symptoms are in it are, are they all the same a burn i mean people talk about burnouts yeah are there different types of burnouts or is there a basic um, common core yeah where you can say that this is a classic burnout because of this and this yeah well now <clears throat> now uh, there is indeed a profile Oh. which has been, um, it's actually quite new. Uh, but there are certain aspects of the burnout that it's different than from uh, depression because it, it looks very much alike, it, it's, but they're not. And depression is really more like a, a, a place where you also have uh, autodestructive feelings and thoughts. Mm. And in a burnout, it's not like that. So you're not very happy but you don't have these thoughts. And that's exactly what I was. I was tired. So you are physically exhausted. All, you the, are, all the time. All the time. Even if you sleep. Even if you sleep, even if you sleep for days, weeks, months. Yeah. You also have uh, uh, problems uh, with cognitive thinking. You, are, uh, you forget things. Um, you cannot think clearly is like a mental fog mm -hmm. then you also have a problem at work because you have had so much stress at work that maybe you might like your job but you take distance so you become a little bit like uh maybe even a little bit cynical about work so there are this kind of uh, there are all those main three things mm. uh that can tell someone i have a burnout 
and especially the exhaustion, you know, that that you cannot do anything. The fatigue, the, the fatigue. complete fatigue. Yeah, yeah. I've heard about it. So when, and when people say, oh, but just put your shoes on and go running and you will feel better. No, you, you are not able to run. Okay. <laughs> Let me make this very clear. If you can go running, then you don't really have a burnout. You mm-hmm. have a, maybe a, 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 call it whatever, you know, nervous breakdown or that's another mm-hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. When you have a burnout, you are not able to come out of bed and uh, or maybe you can go for a walk but that's it Mm. so that happened to me and then this turned my my life upside down um this is actually one of the reasons i of course i started my podcast because i could never believe i it happened to me and i have interviewed many people who exactly like i had never thought they would have a burnout yeah and uh so people say, well, I, you know, it's not going to happen to me. Well, actually, everybody could have a burnout. If the conditions are, if it goes long enough, mm-hmm. enough you know, this uh, is stress at work, problems maybe with also could be outside work, um, being too demanding to yourself, everybody can have a burnout. So I thought it's it, it's a topic for a, 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 a podcast you know? yeah that's excellent I, I was thinking maybe because you said many of your the people you have interviewed they have the same experience that they thought that I that was that's never going to happen to me perhaps a burnout I mean people who are so-called you know type a people who are very outgoing and energetic and all that and have a lot of inner strength they think maybe they are more susceptible to burnout because they are they reject the very idea that they could end up there. Whereas maybe people who are from the start, from the beginning, a little bit, uh, they, have, they, they, have, they lack self-confidence and they, maybe they, they think that they might be susceptible to, to all kinds of, uh, you know, psychological problems. Then they might not even, they not, might not go that far. Yeah, well, it, it That's is. The theory I have. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it is true in the way that the personality, you have like um, uh, so a score. Yeah. <laughs> if you have a, a kind, certain kind of personality, you score higher in the risk. Okay. Yeah, in a risk assessment. And you score higher when you are indeed uh, more demanding to yourself. And when you are so sometimes so motivated that you won't see. This, this very thin line between what's good for you and what's good for others. Mm. So um, there are some people like me who tend to think that can do many things a day and that you can always, um, you know, keep your very basic needs in the second place. Okay. Because you can, you can, I mean, you're healthy, you're young, you're, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, now I think about that very differently. Yes, I yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's also the reason why students get burnt out. There, there are young people about uh, 18, 19, they can get burnt out. Of course, they come out of it much quicker than mm. someone at 45, 50 or 60 because they're very young. Mm. And if it took me maybe a year, maybe they are within four or five months, they're already out of it but they neglect yeah. their own needs yeah and they yeah. just think that I can, yeah yeah and you know anxiety is also something i uh discovered that anxiety it it it, it sounds very negative but we t- we have a very low level of continuous anxiety there's so many things that create this anxiety and it doesn't have to be your boss or a car accident or whatever that you still have in your mind. It can be whatever. I mean, it can be financial, it can be problems with your parents, could be uh, problems with finding money, a job. Uh, or a general feeling that something is wrong with the world. Okay, exactly. That's why you made your own podcast. <laughs> well, many young people have that kind of, you know, they can't really put their finger on exactly what's wrong, but they feel that there's something wrong. Exactly. We're going down the yeah. drain. You're going down the drain. I don't have enough uh, friends in Facebook. Everybody's having fun. But me, this, th- these issues are very actual in, in young people at yeah. this moment. So, uh, but, well, the, so the burnout brought me back uh, to the ground. Mm. And it broke my, my dream completely. Because then in a sudden I was... Of course, but I have a family now and I have more friends than when I came here. Um, but it showed me another kind of reality. 
in, in which I uh, couldn't, I couldn't, um, or I didn't have the control I had over my body. That's something very frightening. Mm. And I guess people are listening now um, that know people with a burnout or people who have uh, even a depression. Um, you cannot go out of it just like turning on the light and it's over or taking your pills or taking your medication. There's no medication. There's a point you are just lying in bed mm. and you don't know how, what to do. So my husband, he was so surprised and he was also looking on the internet. Okay, what, what she's having? What yeah. is this? And uh, my little one was three years old and he's very demanding. A three-year-old one who wants to mama and mommy's lying on bed in the bed. So um, <clears throat> my husband found this book of uh, Joe Dispenza. It's called You Are the Placebo. And he gave it from uh, he he gave it to me in Christmas, and I was like, "You're the placebo, all right." So, well, why not? Huh? So I'll, I'll I'll read it, and I was so surprised because when I was reading it, I thought, oh, "Of course, how could I forget about the unconscious mind and mm. and all these uh, beliefs we have?" Mm. And then I start really looking at myself, and I found another kind of uh, another Gabriella. I forgot. I forgot about that. Mm. I was so busy with the with the world and and being a um, um, well, it's not like you know producing and being no. uh, productive. Mm. You know things that we can see, we can yeah. measure. Yes. And then I thought, oh my god! But that's not the real you. No, but it's, it was like an, an eye opening moment. Mm. And then I thought, of course, I have meditation. Well, I. I did when meditate when I was very young, but again was something to achieve something else. But then I thought, meditate to find myself, to know who I was, to get there again. Why not? If it helps, yeah. Why so not? This book was a was a game changer for you. Yeah. Joe yeah. Dispenza, yeah, it's a fantastic. Yeah, feature. I thought I'm going to try that. The first thing I did, I. Close the book and I'm going to look for meditations. And of course, I found some meditations of uh, Joe Dispenza, but many others, of course. And I went down the rabbit hole yeah. directly into it. And of course, it it worked. It worked after three months of meditating every day because I started with five minutes on it. Mm. Within five minutes, I couldn't think, I, I couldn't meditate anymore. After three months, my short-term memory was okay again. I knew where I put the, the keys. I know I knew everything again. Yeah. It was like magic. Mm. It was I could see everything again in my mind, like before, because I'm also very, uh, you know, I have this photographic kind of, of, of um, mind. I can make photographs of things. Okay. And I had it back. So what happened is that. Through meditation, I also discovered other things. And one, um, I also went to the Wim Hof Methods uh, yes, I workshop. Yes, I was going to ask about that. Yeah. I mentioned the Wim Hof yesterday. Yeah. So I decided to go a little bit further. Maybe just say a little briefly what, what that is about. The Wim Hof Method, well, it's it's the Iceman. Eh? The Iceman the is Iceman. Dutch. Yeah. <laughs> Wim Hof is, uh, is Dutch. And he, uh, he also had, uh, it's very traumatic for him. His wife committed suicide. And to uh, take him out of this, this kind of depression he got in the difficult part of his life, he started breathing, doing ex experimenting with breathing techniques. And, uh, and then he combined it with cold exposure. And he discovered he, could, he, he felt much better. So he developed this and he took it very far. Uh, and at the beginning, people thought he was crazy. And now he has, uh, well, he's worldwide known as the Iceman. Mm. Um, so this breathing brings you deeper inside yourself. And what I discovered was by using it, I can also meditate better. And the cold exposure has give, given me a lot of self-confidence mm. to be exposed to cold and, and not ex you. Well, you so what happens it. when you immerse your body into very, very cold water, did you say? Yeah, well, first you have a shock. Yeah. It's uh, stress. Uh, but your body is, and what's, that's also what Wim, Wim Hof says, is uh, it's designed 
to be able to cope with that kind of stress. So there's a physiological reaction that takes place where your body wants to defend the vital organs, which are, you know, in your chest. So the blood um, flow is, stops, or it's not really stopped, but it's, it's less to your hands and, and legs and feet, you know, extremities. They get less blood. Yeah. And um, so at the moment you stop shaking in the water, you know, you, the, this reaction stops and then you can breathe. Okay. And then you just got this feeling like, all right, now I'm enjoying it. And you can be there for a few minutes, depends on people train until to be there for uh, 20 minutes. Like Wim Hof, he can mm. stay there for hours. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we're talking ice water. I ice water. It's like four just, degrees. Uh, four degrees, yeah. Yeah, four degrees, five degrees. Mm. And uh, so uh, well, I wouldn't recommend that to people, no. actually. It's like not too cold, not too warm. You shouldn't be stay there, staying there for too, too, too many uh, minutes. Uh, but then when you go out, of course, well, you, you feel like numb. You don't feel your feet. You don't feel your hands. Uh, but then your body starts to generate this heat again. And you start shaking because the cold blood begins to circulate through your whole, uh, whole body. Mm. And this, uh, sometimes it's a little difficult because you're shaking and you have to uh, put on some clothes and tea, drink some tea or some coffee uh, but your body has this moment of restart it's like putting your computer off computer and then turn it on mm. but this is um, like clean start yeah. so afterwards you feel very very um, energetic and also very calm also after the, the Wim Hof um, breathing you also get very calm. So you still see the problems. You still know what's wrong in your day or in your life, mm. but you have a, you have taken a step aside. You can see it in the right light, so to speak. Yeah. Take it for what it's worth. Exactly. And that's the problem with, with many of us, but we, we exaggerate the problems and we make them bigger than they are and we can't see exactly. clearly, Yeah. especially when we're frightened. Exactly. So you have also run. Huh? You told me yesterday you also used to run. Yeah, before my I had my hip problems. Yeah, yeah, that's a pity. But this is also what happens when you run. You go running and you feel afterwards much better. You know, you have all this oxygen in your in your in your in your body. Well, they say it's the, they don't know if it's really endorphins or uh, other substances in your in your uh, hormonal system that help you feel better. But you always feel like, okay, well, I still have the problems I had, but now I can see it in a different yeah, light. Yeah, I, I can relate to that. I agree that that's the way it works. And I mean, also after meditation, of course, I mean, that's what I do now that makes me reach a place which is more productive and, and more loving and more um, realistic, really. Uh, it feels about the same way after meditation. I can also begin thinking about the things that I was going to do the, during the day uh, in, in a completely different light. I see, as you say, I can see exactly the same tasks and the same problems, quote unquote, I must say, because there are no really real problems, actually. There are just things to do and challenges. And uh, I mean, I, I, I might have had, for instance, a little bit, I might have been a little bit nervous about a meeting I was going to have with some person or something or a bit nervous about some kind of uh, task that I, I'm having. And after meditation, I can feel that uh, I don't feel that nervousness anymore. And it's, it, it, it uh, stands out as a, a little bit ridiculous, really. I mean, <laughs> why, what is there to be nervous about? I just, I just, I'm just doing this. I'm meeting one human being. I'm a human being. I'm meeting another human being. Yeah. We're having an interaction. What's the problem? Yeah. Well, we're nervous about it. <laughs> Nothing is dangerous. Yeah. Almost nothing is dangerous. So, well, just, just, well, just Mexico City is dangerous. <laughs> well, Mexico City can be dangerous, I guess. But I mean, there, I, I didn't get robbed. But you know. so, anyway, this the name of your podcast, "Escape from the Burnout Society." So, let's talk a little bit about the society part here. Because, um, do you think that there are certain aspects of our society, or has it have they always been there in in every society due, through all through history, or are there certain things in our time that makes uh, this problem bigger 
that makes us more prone to to burn out. Yeah, I guess it is. I guess it is. I mean, I've been doing a lot of research uh, on this since uh, since I started with the podcast because really I was on one hand I'm reading about meditation, cold exposure, of uh, so so many things, uh, but I'm also reading about science and mm. what. Uh, how do you, do you what, what are the symptoms and what can you do about it and the you know percentage of women and against men you know and they say well men women tend more to burn down than men the men get more depressed okay uh so it's also the way we cope with things why do you think that that difference is well the difference is that women uh, uh, they have tend to have more social engagement more family uh, ties, you know, and friends, more friends. So you can cope a little bit better with, with issues in your life. Mm. So you still go over this thin line of what is good for you or for others. So that's what you get burned out at, at the end. Men are tend more to keep it for themselves. Okay. So when men have a lot of stress and they have a lot of um, work problems and uh, and they don't talk about it, then they get depressed. I see. Yeah. So that's the difference. Yeah. That's about the difference. So men tend more to commit suicide and then because of the depression. Yeah, I guess I've, I've seen that in the statistics. Yeah. yeah. It's also, of course, a, a problem about this uh, society where men have a, a kind of profile and they have to fit in. You know, of course, not all men keep everything for themselves. Mm. That's not true. No, no, but I mean, no. you have to talk about group uh, averages sometime, exactly. yeah. sometimes in order to understand what is happening. Yeah. So I discovered those things, those facts, and I also discovered that, uh, well, actually, the, the most burned out used to be in um, uh, in the medical uh, field. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, because and it, there are a lot of women working there, of course. There's also a lot of women, indeed. And, you know, working hours late at night, very early in the morning. <clears throat> you have to cope with a lot of, of anger, depression from patients, sadness. And, uh, and if, if you cannot keep this outside, of course, it, it's a moment then, then you, you burned out. Mm. Um, but it's now in many other professions. So it is a, a problem of this... Um, modern society western society where we are what i in the place where i was you think being productive is the main the most important thing of work being productive has to be um measured mm. you know if you want to have more money if you want to have a race then you have to prove that you are more productive and you have to be more productive with less resources you know this kind of capitalistic way of thinking more with less mm. Mm. and they say less is more so <laughs> well there's there's a point mm. where it's not like that it's also for for students i mean i've, I've talked to be, to students have been burnt out and they have the feeling that the 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 standard is so high they have to be there and they always have the feeling they are here you know i have to have a nine at the university i have to get an eight and i have um to um, to be the best, yeah. and when we also have friends, and they are the best in in, in sports, or they are the best in uh, you know. So everybody has to be the best, yeah. the best of comparing yourself on continuously. a measurable scale. Yeah, and, and and the thing is that we compare each other, we compare ourselves to others all the time, which is crazy, really. Which is crazy, indeed. You can't compare yourself with anybody, anybody else, really, can you? I mean, you are you are you, and you are unique. Exactly. You're not a robot. <laughs> no, and what you told me about, what you asked me about this society, yeah, well, look, uh, I also have written many articles about how uh, people think about social media. Yeah. And social media is a great resource when you want to communicate and you want to find people who are in the same level as you are, you know, that, that resonate with you. Yes. But at the moment, you see all these perfect pictures in Instagram, in, in Facebook, and these stories like we are for dinner and we are having uh, Christmas. And well, there are many lonely people mm. to think like my, my life doesn't look like that. Mm. So, yeah, it, it is more difficult now because there are most, much more distraction. 
I told you about Salma, she's seven, and we told her we don't watch TV. No. And we, you, you can see your tablet, your videos for only one hour a day. And you have to choose which videos, you know. Why? Because we want her to be with herself. I, want, I don't want her to become 40 and get burnt out to find out that, <laughs> that it was not necessary. Yes. That it was not yeah. necessary. So, yeah, it's, it's part of this cultural. Uh, well. Yeah, it's, I, I think it's great what you're saying. I, I, I think you're right, of course. But uh, I was thinking, if you go back in history, 50 years, 100 years, 200 years, I think people weren't particularly more happy back then but they had other problems maybe maybe they didn't burn out but they were unhappy because of i mean they were also struggling to meet certain standards that were there in society at that time women were even in europe women were less uh, independent and they, they they had this pressure on them that they should uh, produce children and and the the of service for their husbands and all those kinds of uh, kinds of things and, and men were well, they struggled in, in, in all kinds of ways, but they, maybe they didn't burn out or, or maybe they did, but we, they didn't have any name for it. Yeah, well, that's a good question. They, I mean, they, yeah. they committed suicide. They have, people have always committed suicide all, all through history. Yeah, well, probably depression more is, men than women also. Yeah, uh, depression has always been there yeah. and always be there, unfortunately. But burning out, according to the World Health Organization, is actually almost only related to work. But the interesting thing is that if you think that our work is eight hours a day, that was how it was uh, designed in designed. the 1800s. Exactly. Yeah. Eight when hours for work. Industrialization came. Yeah. Eight hours for sleeping and eight hours for yeah, the rest. Yeah, yeah. Okay. What is the rest? Yeah, what is the rest? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So if you think about this, maybe uh, 50 years ago, the rest might be more calm you know you have more time for yourself could be could be always uh if you would work only eight working eight hours because so many years ago people would work like you know, 12 hours a day or even mm. more um but it's the quality of the time that you have for yourself yeah i think that's the, the main the main thing and um Eight hours, you might think, oh, it's a lot of time. Yeah, but of course, you have to go, go doing groceries and you have to clean the house and you all these things, you know, and not everybody has the money to uh, afford uh, someone to do it for, for you, you no, know. So no. the, those hours are not there. And not everybody has the money to play golf for eight hours. Exactly, or to go on a holiday no. you know, three times a year. Yeah, I get what you're saying. I mean, they, they probably didn't have, I mean, today... One of the dilemmas we have is that the work is bleeding into leisure time. So we, we work almost all the time because we can always answer emails and text messages, uh, even when we're supposed to be sleeping, perhaps. Yeah. And people do that, unfortunately. Yeah. That's and uh, when I was a manager, they were also, ex the, my boss were expecting me to do that. Yeah. But you have, only two days in the in a week to be with your family, you know, and then those two days were most of the times not even together because it would be one Wednesday and then a Sunday or a Sunday and a Tuesday. And then you also have to split your attention with all these uh, apps that are coming in and sometimes an email. So you don't have any spare no. time anymore. Yeah. Uh, so, you, yeah, you mentioned the meditation techniques and, and, um, methods that you have to to find your inner peace and all that your dispense of involved your spiritual transformation you told me this has also come about in a way in many ways i guess uh by way of a very very intriguing episode namely a near-death experience and this sounds really interesting and and dramatic perhaps can you tell us when that was and what, what happened How yeah it changed you well, first of all, I will tell you that I didn't really know I had an NDE, which is, um, uh, it can happen. Mm -hmm. And for people that are listening, uh, you can find out only if you don't remember by doing a regression. 
And how did I find over meditating? So this is what yeah. happens. Yeah. One day I did my Wim Hof meditation. I was already quite, um, well, away from the burned out and all these things. I was already thinking like, like what I was going to do with my life now. So I thought I'm going to meditate. I'm going to go very deep and let's see where I go. And what happened is that the first thing I saw was a kind of flash about my youth. And I'm in the kitchen in Mexico. I am four years old, five years old, and I see my mother and she's cooking. But it was everything was like gray. Like, like it was not full color. It was like black and white, black and white almost. Mm -hmm. And then I look around and I feel like, oh my God, there's no way I can remember this because this is so detailed. So many things about that time that I couldn't just remember. But I thought, okay. And then I suddenly, all in a sudden, I had a very, very uh, deep feeling of sadness. And I started to cry. And then I thought, like, but why am I crying? I mean, my mom, my mom died, unfortunately, many years ago. And, uh, but it was not that, you know, like being with my mom that was missing her. And I thought, why am I crying? And it was a sadness that was, like, deep inside. So I opened my eyes and I started thinking, why? Mm. So I tried one more time, just a few days later. I did the same. And I went to the same place and I got to get again this feeling. And then I remember like, oh, wait, wait, there's something here. This sadness comes from all this loneliness I had when I was young. And why do I was lonely? And then I remember, yeah, you were lonely because you didn't want to go with friends. You didn't have any friends. And what, how was, why did it was like that? So I opened my eyes and I started remembering. And then I was suddenly in my, in my youth and suddenly was a girl again. And then I thought, oh, yes, now I know. Because when I was young, I, um, I couldn't get along with, uh, with children. And my mom would say, go out and play with children. I said, no, mom, I, don't, I cannot handle ch children. Okay. I don't want to be with them. Yeah. Um, so I started reading about these kind of regressions and things about the past. And, and I stumbled against this book of, uh, you, you interviewed him, this um, Dutch cardiologist, uh, Pim van Lommel. Pim van Lommel, yeah. Yeah, about NDEs. And in his book, I just read my profile as a child. Okay. It was me when mm. I was four or five years old. And then I thought, yeah, I drowned in a, in a swimming pool in Mexico. So that's I how found out that these feelings came actually after this event when I drowned in a, in a swimming pool. But my family told me that was nothing happened because we, you were you were floating on the swimming pool with your head in the water, but nothing happened to you. And I forgot about that. They forgot about that. But my whole youth from four or five years until I think it was like. Uh, puberty it was I was completely lonely and I couldn't relate with no one mm. uh, excepting from some 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 grown-up people around me and um, so I decided to make a regression I, I, I bought some I, I found someone on the internet and uh, I told him I want you to take me to that day and I want to see what I saw so he said do you remember anything no I don't really remember were you very anxious when you went in there to do this or did, were you Hopefully. Well, I was, I was a little bit skeptic actually. Okay. I was skeptic that I would see anything mm. because I have a good memory, and I thought, why I can't see this? What happened? What might have happened? So I was like, if it happened, I would like to see more, and and have images and. Well. So what happened is I, um, um, we it was via Zoom, you know, with uh, through Zoom. Yeah. And uh, so I lie down, and this person knew immediately what to say. It was really magical because within like 10 minutes, I was there again. Wow. And I see things like little children would see things from beneath. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you're looking at the world like if you are really four or five years yes, old. Yes, yes. Yeah. And um, so I see the swimming pool. I feel like, yes, I'm going inside. 
because it's, it's something I want to do. I like, I love water. I always love water. So I jump into the water and then I feel this water coming to my lungs, coming to my nose. I start screaming during the session because I'm feeling I'm, I'm drowning and that I cannot grab anything. I cannot swim. Mm. And uh, so this person is very, was very professional. He, he, he took me out of this moment because it's really very traumatic. Mm. And uh, then he says, what are you seeing? And then I saw, yes, I, I, I see uh, the, the whole world is, is light up. It's completely yellow. It's like a light. It's like I'm, I'm still seeing water, but it's, it's completely lighted. And he said, what do you feel? It's warm. Now it's warm and it's calm and there's nothing here to be afraid of. And uh, is there someone with you? I said, well, I don't see anyone, but I know that I'm okay. Mm. So actually there were no more really vivid images. Like it, but that's the end of a real, um, I mean, like the reality at that moment, but I still at that moment, I, I got more information about that I shouldn't uh, be afraid because someone was going to pick me up. And when they... And that someone was not a, a physical person or... Is that the only thing I get at that moment? Yes. Uh, but uh, that that everything is going to be okay, and that um, that at that moment that was enough information for me. And the person who was going to pick me up was my sister because she threw herself into the water to get me out. Okay, okay, yeah. And so this person who was helping me with my regression said, "Before you you are picked up, do there something else you should know?" And I say, "Well, look." Now I see stars, but I don't know if I'm four years old anymore. I don't know who am I right now. I see stars. I see like black and I see all this huge um, environment around me. And I am like just in bliss. I don't want to leave anymore. Mm. And this person who is making, doing the regression says, you, uh, you want to stay? So, well, actually, yes. Actually, I don't want to go back anymore to the swimming pool, if I'm very honest. Yeah. Um, but then I still hear someone saying, like, you have to go back. And indeed, then I have this feeling, my sister's coming. And I start crying again because I don't want to go back. Mm. Just please leave me here. Because I know it's going waiting for me mm. when I wake up. Mm. So it's a very special moment, Anders, because... You know in this regression that you are in the regression, you know. So you are, at that moment, I was like 46, I guess. But you are also four years old. Yeah. And then you are also another person somewhere else. Mm. Very confusing. Very confusing. Mm. So when I get out of the trance, um, I also, just before I got out, I had the feeling that my mom was somewhere. Okay. And uh, so he said, the person was helping me. He said, well, maybe you want to say hello to your mom. I said, well, I think it's very nice to feel her around. Um, and it was just a feeling. Uh, it, I didn't see anyone. I didn't see, I hear she, any voice. She, she was alive when you we had this Before. swimming pool incident, yeah. but she died soon after? Or? No, no, she was. She was uh, when you were grown up. Yeah, that's the thing. So she is there in the regression. Yeah. As a grown up, she's yeah. there somewhere. Uh, so that's why it's very confusing. When you wake up and you get out of the regression, you have so much information to think about mm. because you saw things as a child, but you also saw things from later on in the future. Um, so it, you have to make a kind of story because that's where our brain works. Mm. You need a story to in understand. In this 3D reality, we need, yeah. we need the linear story. Exactly. For it to make sense to us. But it, I think time doesn't really exist on, on that level. No, exactly. <laughs> Everything happens at the, at the same time. You are a girl, but you are, you are a grown up. Yeah. Everything at the same time. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's very fascinating. So it took me weeks to, 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 um, <laughs> to land again and to take my life again uh, over, you know, and... Um, but what I discovered was indeed, so when I came back, I might just have took this information about uh, being a whole and being in peace and uh, 
this uh, harmony that it's in the in the universe. So when I got back to my body as a child, and I would see children bothering each other, yelling each other, um, you know, uh, uh, mistreating animals, or when when I would see discrimination, mm. you know, in Mexican society, there's a lot of discrimination because you have Indian blood or you, or you're mm. so, you're not from a social mm. status, whatever. Kids you were know. bullying each other for different exactly. reasons. I would panic, but I would not panic because they were doing it to me, because because they were doing it. The only existence of of uh, uh, this aggression would really scare me to death. And it was not because it was for me, it was because I saw it happening. Yeah, yeah. And um, so this, uh, this I took, and of course, when you grow up, you have to still cope with the rest. Mm. And I forgot that. Well, no, you don't forget. You you put it under the cover. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. You, yeah. You, you just... You have it, uh, yeah, you, subconsciously. It's, 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 there it's hidden. Time. It's hidden. It's hidden. And also, like, I, I still have this with people. When I see someone, and just after a few words, I already know what kind of energy that is. Mm. And I, as a child, I would see people and I would turn around and leave. Mm. And my mom would say, like, you know, stay, you know, you have to give a hand. Child. Yeah, you see, strange. This is acting strangely. Yeah. So that's why, but many people who've had NDEs, they say that uh, the memory of this is so vivid. It's like what they experienced there was is more real than this reality. So they, they never forget it. They, they can say that 20, 30 years afterwards, 40 years afterwards, they, they often say that. It's just as if it happened yesterday. It's clear, crystal clear and vivid, and I will never forget. But, and even if they had um, these experiences as children, like for instance, um, Ingrid Honkala, mm -hmm. I think you have also interviewed yeah, her. Yeah, I also interviewed yeah. her, yeah. But, but you have, you, apparently you forgot about this. Yeah. As you say, conscious on your conscious level. And now you, but now you can remember that you have been able to remember it in regression. Can you recall that memory anytime you want? I mean, you did it, you just did it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is, it is. It, then it, it comes to the surface. It comes to the surface. It comes to the surface. So it's, it's with you now. Yeah. 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 It's, it's in the and, and it's interesting to, to hear that this was apparently also the explanation for why you were the kind of child that you were from the age of four and why we did, you didn't want to play with others. And you didn't understand that at, at the time or your parents didn't understand what was happening. And Nope. No. And my brother and my sister didn't understand. And all these thoughts I had as a child, <clears throat> I never wrote them down. Uh, but one day my mom said to me, and I, I think I was like six, seven years old. She said, you know, you're just too special. Mm, yes. <laughs> well, I I think you were. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so I asked my, my brother, my sister, did she ever tell you that to you? No, no, she didn't. Mm. So I really had this kind of conversation with my mom mm. that my mom was saying, what, what can I tell to her? She's just too wise for her age. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> so, yeah, well, this determined a lot of my path. And then we are coming back again to this solitude. I told you when I came to Holland and this. Uh, yeah. Um, well, this feeling started there. That solitude is never solitude. You're never alone. You're never alone. You're never alone. No. And this has been with me all my life, even unconsciously. Mm. So that's why I could be in Holland. There was um, there was some uh, half a year that I was living at someone's place uh, for free. I didn't have money. I was broke, and there was no telephone and no television. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And there was no day at all that I would feel like depressed or, or sad or yeah. I was alone with myself. Yeah. Great. So that is something I took from this 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 experience, of course, that you're yeah. never alone. Yeah. You're never alone. So it was a gift. You, you might say it was a gift to have had this experience, even though you had forgotten it, but you got you, you were given a gift by the universe to be able to be in solitude, to be lonely without feeling lonely. Exactly. Which many people really can't do. Can't. They're afraid. They're afraid. Well, they can do everybody. Everybody can do it, of course, if they find their inner core. But but we're conditioned to be on the surface. On this, 
that's why we started our podcast, I guess. Yeah. And this story goes a little bit further because I forgot so many things that when my mom died, I was 17, I was just 18, and I was in Mexico. <clears throat> um, I saw her dying, and she, the, her last words were something like, Jesus, don't let me down. I felt, oh, come on, you know, Jesus, you're not going to let my mom die. But he did, you know, he, she died. And, of course, she had cancer, and we mm. know that it, it was the worst, the, her last days. And um, But I have forgotten all these things I saw, and they were not more in my conscious, it was, it was in my conscious, but not in my conscious uh, thoughts. Mm. So when my mom died, uh, I thought, well, this is over. She's not there anymore. And still, I went to say goodbye to her and, and, and everything. Two days later, we are at home. And I'm leaving my bed. She, we, she was very quickly cremated. My father didn't want to organize anything uh, fancy at all. And uh, he was really very pragmatic, like, let's get you know, through this. Over, yeah. Let's get over it. So we put the ashes in, in my place, in my room, middle of the night, there's, there's a, a painting that flies from one part to the other side of the room. Wow. Bam. Kabam. And my, my dad comes to my room and opens the door and he says, what did you do? I said, I did nothing. I was sleeping. Did you see anything? No, but we, we both saw that, that this painting really detached because it, 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 the painting just gets lost from, from, the, from the spikes or whatever it's, it's hanging. Yeah. It, it falls like this, isn't mm -hmm. it? Straight down along the wall. Or maybe like, no, no, this went to the other side. <laughs> it flew right across the room. Yes, it ended on the other side. So my dad and I, we were like. ¿Qué pasa? ¿Qué pasa? ¿Qué pasó? Nothing. Okay, good night. Let's sleep. And uh, next morning I, I went to see and, you know, find out what happened, but I couldn't find any logical exp explanation. Moreover, this has never happened before. Mm. And, uh, and uh, the nails were still on the wall. Okay. Both. There are two nails. Oh. And I thought, okay, uh, I don't understand. But things began to happen. And that um, I would just think like no this really didn't happen or this has another explanation mm. or and my both my father and I we were in denial and he he wouldn't tell me about what he experienced and I wouldn't tell him what I experienced we were living alone huh? this, this moment my brother and sister left home so I was denying it he was denying it and one day he was talking about my mom and saying things that were not really very nice and I was eating and then suddenly I saw the 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 fork was just sticking to my to my as it, as it would be magnetic uh -huh. to my arm. How odd! And I felt like oh my god. Um, so I told my father like, do you see this? But he was talking; he was not looking at me. And then it stopped. So I thought this is very strange. This is really getting strange. <laughs> and uh, Uri Geller. a little bit scared. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was a little bit scared by then. And uh, but I forgot about these things. And and that's it's the end. And this, we can have these hints mm. and 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 and, um, and messages. Yeah. But if you deny, if you don't look, you don't look further. You stop mm. and think, what is this about? Yeah. Then you will not discover. It took me almost 15, 20 years to understand what my mom was saying. And... Um, did, sorry, did this painting that flew all across the room, did it have any connection to your mother? Not really. Okay. Not really. It, it was not, no. But... Uh, Maybe she had chosen it or she liked it or something like that. Well, it was very obvious that that painting would fl fly over because if it would have fallen down like this, it would have taken everything that was underneath. So it was very, very clear okay, precise. that like it that. didn't fail like this. Yeah. It really went boom it to wanted the other to, side. To make a point just for you, not, yeah. not destroy anything, just make a point. Just make a point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so uh, year, years later, again, at his place, my, my father's place, I was talking about my mom. 
Yeah. And then um, my father is married again. They live there and they're very happy. Um, so I'm talking about my mom, just like we are doing right now. Mm. And at the moment, I close the door because I leave. I say, okay, guys, see you tomorrow. I close the door again in the same wall. The painting falls down. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> this, is, ah! this is too much. <laughs> And then my father phoned me. You know just what happened? No. And he explains. He said, really? Yeah. It happened the way, exactly the way it happened 20 years ago when your mom died. And so then, well, and then I realized on this, like, of course, when you have these experiences and then I have my regression and all these things, then all in a sudden you say, oh, well, of course. Yeah. Now I understand. It's true. It's true. It's true. My mom would only wanted to say, I am still here. Yeah. We don't die. Yeah. We don't die. Yeah. And I move things. Mm. So you are you pay attention. Mm. Just pay attention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what you wanted to say. Wonderful. So well, my brother doesn't believe me. Some friends of mine don't do, do not believe me. Uh, because they haven't seen it, they yeah. haven't experienced it. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, they can they can believe take you for your what you're saying. I mean, for your words, believe what you're saying, but they don't do that. Or they they say, oh, there's probably some other explanation to that. Yeah, most of the times. I hope they don't think you're lying or anything. Well, I also hope uh, hope uh, it, I'm not lying. Well, they think I'm not <laughs> lying. Um, but still, you have your, your father, and he, you and him can can talk about it. And he, yeah. Now that he he's knows, 88. Yeah. Now, now he knows. Now we share this mm. because he also had some other kind of experiences, and he was atheist, and he changed his mind. One day, he said, "Your mom came mm. in a dream," and as many times, but he said, "But this dream was really very real," and she came with Jesus. He mm. said, "I don't believe in Jesus," <laughs> 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 and he said, "Actually, I thought, what a strange person." Yeah. And but what a peace I'm feeling. Mm. Oh, what a peace. This is great. It feels great. Mm. And then my mom said, Oh, this is Jesus. By the way, this is Jesus. <laughs> yes. Let me introduce my friend Jesus. <laughs> and my father said, well, I don't believe in Jesus. <laughs> no. Not even as a historical figure. <laughs> yeah, I think not even. Okay. So um then he told me like this peace I felt, it was so great mm. that I started to change my mind. <laughs> Because yeah, then, then this it's a, it's a feeling, you know. Yeah. It's it's really a feeling you have never had before. That's the thing. Is what you feel that is the true reality, mm. not what you think or what you're conditioned to believe. It's yeah. what you feel inside. It's what you feel inside. So you say, well, and it's, it's not that now he believes in Jesus, not at all. But he just thought like maybe there are many things mm. that I have just discarded. You know, I said like, no, this is not true, and this is uh, this is a lie or yeah. whatever. Uh, Manipulation from church, or maybe maybe Jesus really existed. Maybe, maybe there's something, you know, as an entity that that uh, we have called Jesus. And uh, so well, the, so that that's how the way I went to in the rabbit hole. Yeah. And uh, so it, it changed everything. Mm. I should also do this regression therapy, I guess. Uh, my ex-wife did it, and uh, it, she has has some really interesting experiences around that and, and she she remembered things from previous lives and things like that. I, I, I don't really have I have never had any sense any sense that I have had previous lives in that respect. I mean many people talk about dreams they that had that have had that character, you know, that kind of feel to them that uh, they're telling about previous lives. I've never had that. Have you had that kind of dreams? No, no, that I, well, I have lucid dreams. Yeah. You, you had lucid dreams? Yeah. After okay. I started meditating, yes, I had lucid Maybe dreams. Maybe you practiced how to, how to do that. Yeah. But I, I hear you can, you can, you can train yourself to, to be able to have lucid dreams. Well, it is, it's trainable. It's trainable. And I was not really trying to do that, but by doing this deep meditation is a kind of lucid dream because uh -huh. you almost get, you get into the frontier of falling asleep. Yeah. You're there. You're just not asleep. Okay, right? hypnagog. Uh, yes, yeah. word kind of hypnagogic uh, kind of uh, yeah. state. state. Yeah. 
so that's why you can get uh, lucid dreams uh, from mm. it. So I have once or twice I've had one, okay. be- very mm. beautiful. But uh, but I think unless everybody everybody can have a regression, yeah. and it's it's. Um, they say also that it's not the person who is doing the the, the hypnosis or this regression. It's it's really you mm. if you're willing to go. Of course, yeah. Well, I don't have a specific episode that I would like them to take me back to. At least not what I can think of now. But it would be more a general regression, I guess, as to whether I had previous lives and if I can go back to it. But we'll see. That should be interesting. I, I ought to do that really. I also was. You, one thing you said made me think about what my previous guest, uh, Lars Mool, said to me when I interviewed him, also here in Amsterdam. You said that you, I mean, after this near-death experience that you had forgotten, but but was still active in you because you had a hard time playing with other kill- children and you said that you, you felt a sadness and or you, you were even shocked when you saw that they were bullying each other and they were mistreating animals and things like that. Lars Moore said that he, I mean, he had some kind of mystical experiences already when he was uh, a child. And when he was eight years old, he said very surprised, he was very surprised at what he had experienced and saw around him. And he said to his mother, mother, I think this world is very primitive. And and he wasn't joking. He was like (laughs) saying it very seriously. He was eight years old and his mother was, uh, really? Where, do you, where did that come from? How can you say a thing like that? But he, Lars Moody is now 70 years old, and he could remember how he felt when he was a child, that he actually had this feeling, this sense that this can't be the real reality, the, the best world that we have. This is really primitive. And I mean, if you had that feeling as, as an eight-year-old, there is something. I mean, you have, you have brought something with you into this world. You know something that you're, you're not supposed to know. I mean, it's, uh, to me, it's all of these things are really obvious, but it's a very good example. And it uh, sounds sounds like what you yeah. are telling. Yeah, it, it's exactly that, exactly that feeling, and that you know there's something that is hidden because you cannot see it mm-hmm. with your eyes. That is beautiful, mm-hmm. harmonic, you know, and harmonious. There's yeah. there's no evil like like we know like evil, no destruction in that yeah. in that way, and. Um, so I now that I have a, a seven year old, I also look very different to children mm. because I think some children have this kind of wisdom, yeah. whether they took it or because of they are very sensible to it. And um, and I also discovered Anders that we have been uh, educating our children in the wrong way. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the very wrong way. We are. We are. Well, especially we in the sense that society is doing it. Yeah. And, and of Schools. course, as, as, a, as, as a father, I mean, you, you also have children. Mm. Uh, we want the best. But we think mater- in this materialistic world, you know, in the materialism paradigm we are living, it's like, so you can have your own stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you can have a job or you can have, make a living. Um that's true. But what if your child tells you, "Mom, this 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 reality is too primitive." Yeah. What do you do then? Yeah, I would today. I would probably. I mean, I was too immature when our kids were small. Not that small, I think. Well, I wasn't. I, I, I'm I'm pretty mature, I guess. But but I'm I'm, I'm learned. I have learned so much uh, about life and and what life can be since then. So uh, at that time, I wouldn't have reacted wisely i think but today if i had an eight-year-old who said that to me i would probably realize that i that this child can can teach me things so i would start asking what, what do you mean by that and, and i mean treat this person that, as, a, as an equal because on the soul level we are equal i mean an eight-year-old and a 58 year old same same two souls communicating yeah they just have no fewer words to use with their mouth, but but I mean, I think you 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 can be born here with a very old soul or with a young soul. You can be wise or less wise, but it's I mean it's it's there from the beginning. Yeah, or you remember less. Yeah, because I think everybody has an old soul, but you just don't remember. You're more. Yeah, could be. I mean, who knows? Yeah, how it works. 
I also don't know exactly, but it, it's true. I mean, when I talked to my mom, I also felt like Ingrid Honkala said that we were like equal. Mm. Yeah. I, I didn't feel like, oh, but, uh, you know, great wisdom of mom and dad. And no, I felt like I have the feeling I know even more than you ha- do. You, yeah, I had that too, actually. Yeah. Towards my parents, which made me feel a bit, I got, felt bad conscious about that when I was younger, but... Um, Today, I, I can realize that it was probably true. I mean, I, and, and they were treating me very, very nicely and, and lovingly. And, uh, and they recognized that I was, I knew a lot of things and I was wise and all that. So I shouldn't complain, but I can remember that I had that feeling. That I, I, I had that sense that, oh, they're doing and saying these, because, these things because they don't know better. Something like that. So I didn't blame them for anything. I just knew that I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna go further than, than, they, than they have so do you Gabriela would you say that you are after all that you've been telling us here do you feel that you're so to speak aligned with your true self today or more aligned than you used to be yeah for sure for sure and um, <clears throat> it was a long way uh, <laughs> it was not the the shortcut was the long way home yeah. but um i fortunately have this experience with with things moving at my father's place because this gives you an, a reassurance of there's something else that we don't see mm. and for many people um and i mean i include myself you know uh, we are so engaged with the materialistic world with everything we see and touch and feel that that's the best way still to communicate and to to uh, grab our attention, you know, you do, to catch our attention. We need things. Um, so now I want to, I have been looking more inside and then you discover another world. And that's the real, real world. Um, and the idea of the podcast was for me uh, first to bring more attention to uh, a topic that is new and it's going to be here for many years, unfortunately, because the society has to change a lot, especially the workplace, mm-hmm. if we want to avoid people from getting burned out. Mm-hmm. Uh, but secondly, because it's also aligned with this, this, uh, this like new way of looking at life. So when I interview people, I can interview very known people, but I can also interview people just on the street. Mm-hmm. For me, it's not so important. Because if someone has a story to tell, yes, then that's the most important. Uh, that's the most important. But um, talking about burnout and this this inner trip, this inner discovery, uh, when you find out that you won't die, you will leave your body here, but you won't die. Then I ask people who are willing to listen. Yeah. Then yeah. I ask them. Yeah. Just put your feet there and think, I'm not going to die. Now tell me, what do you want to take with you? And then you decide your life. Yeah. If you do that, then every step you take, it will be aligned with yourself. Yeah. But you have to be there. Yeah. So I told once a friend, just imagine. I know you don't believe me, but just imagine for a second, you're not going to die ever. What do you want to take when mm. you leave? And he looked at me and said, it's going to be your diplomas on the, you know, on the wall. <laughs> it's going to be your Lamborghini. It's going to be maybe, uh, I don't know, all these trips you've been doing alone. And, you know, think about that. What is going to go, go with you? And he looked at me, he gave me, and I'm like, oh, now you're asking something difficult. So, no, I don't want to read the answer. You don't need the answer. Think like that. Yeah, think about it. Think about that. Mm, hundreds. And, and, and the, the, the Escape from the Burnout Society addresses these kind of questions at a certain point. Of mm. course, we want to know what are the symptoms. We want to know what you can do to avoid it. I want to ask, uh, you know, uh, directors and CEOs, how do they cope with this? Of course, you know, practical mm. things. Mm. But, awesome. m- but many deep, um, untouched um, topics are like, okay, why do we have anxiety? Why are we afraid? Yeah. What for? Mm. 
Well, where's the glory? Where I mean, that's that's from? the core um, reason for for people being burnt out and, and having these yeah. issues. But they're afraid of dying. Yeah. At the core of things, really. Yeah. Imagine what would happen. How much society would change if people realized that they don't die. I mean, that would change every, everything. Yeah, but you have to feel it. You have to feel it, of course. Yeah, you have to feel it. You have to feel it. And and it's difficult because, as I told you, Anders, when you can feel that you're young and you're older and you're maybe even later, you know, at, at all at the same time, then you understand that things have for us to happen in a certain, uh, yeah, Order of order, order. Uh, yeah, yeah. sequence. No. No. Sequence, it's a better word. Perhaps. And uh, so you won't say, okay, I'm, I'm immortal, so I'm going to do whatever I want. Mm. You know, there might be people who are talking ironically like that, so well, then I can do anything. Mm. But it's not quite like that. It's first you have to, to kill a little bit your ego. Yeah. Understand that your ego is not you. And then you will see what are really those things you really want to take. So, um, so I hope that with my podcast, I can find experts that help people find these answers in themselves. Yeah. I mean, it's not that we know answers, more answers than anyone. Of course not. Mm -hmm. But um, what makes me every day very motivated about still having the podcast mm -hmm. is that uh, uh, you bring this information to people just slightly in another way, just slightly what they need to, to find this answer, to make this question today. That like one day I realized, oh my God, I have an ND. Mm. No? Mm. Like somebody gives you a book mm. and you feel like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. How could I be so blind? Yeah. Has your spiritual evolvement and uh, journey and, um, and this these changes in, in your life also made you feel aligned with people around you and the world out there. <laughs> Two things. Yourself, you said yes. But yeah. What about the, uh... <clears throat> with the rest? Well, no, that's a kind of uh, uh, a, a feeling I got when I was young that what I saw outside was not really what I wanted to see, mm. that it didn't match with each other and it's it's the same with i think uh 80 of my friends they don't understand where this all comes from mm. um but it's a, there's a shift there's a shift i mean that's the, what more about your podcast you know there's a shift yeah there's a shift going around Do yeah you see the sure. signs Do yes. you see things happening yeah definitely yes no. there there are and that makes me more uh, uh positive about the future of that makes me feel more positive about the future because they <clears throat> they are a little bit more open and you mean young people in general or, or i think uh, all of them will old people like us <laughs> <laughs> well you're not old <laughs> um no i think as in, in any way my friends are about let's say 35 plus they just realize, is this it? Mm. You know, there are so many things going on. Mm. And this... Uh, turbulence out there. Yeah, the turbulence out there. The people are thinking like, is, where are we going? Where are we heading to? Mm. And, and uh, the social media, what I told you, is this real? How can we deal with this? So mm. people are asking questions, uh, reflecting more. That's a start. And that's a start. I mean, in my... A circle of friends i really have maybe one or two friends with with, with i can talk to um but why as i told you if you don't have these experiences it's very difficult it's like okay it's but it's a story it's not an experience it's a, it's a story yeah yeah well it's like reading about spiritual things reading books about spiritual awakenings and things like that when you when you don't really understand what it is viscerally in, in inside yourself i mean i read many of those books when i was maybe 28 29 30 31 and and i kind of knew intellectually that this is this is true probably true i believe it but i didn't feel it that, that way i didn't have any inner experiment experience of it which i have had now lately the last few years i can 
when I meditate and think I didn't meditate at, at that time. So when I do that, I can I can I can really feel that it, it is there is something out there. And I don't I don't have to be afraid of anything. I'm not going to die. I mean, the, the essence of what is me is not going to die. So as you say, you have to feel it. So two different things. But well, it's a start. If, it's a big, good start if people are asking questions about what is happening, I guess, and, uh, and whether this is all there is. Uh, so maybe, maybe we're in for some changes here. Yeah, and as I told a friend of mine, uh, look, if, if somebody tells you there's a marvelous beach in uh, Mexico or in, um, Madrid, in Spain or whatever, and you feel like, oh, sounds nice. Well, go there. Yeah. Back to things go. Mm. Well, it's the same with spiritual things. If you feel like, oh, really? Do it. Do Just it. do it. Just do it. Just do it. Close mm. your eyes and go meditating. Try. Just try. Yeah. So, Gabriela, what are your dreams and goals for yourself, for your podcast, and all the other projects you have, your bis- new business and all this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, one <clears throat> of the things I also realized is that uh, when I was a graphic designer, uh, I always thought like, well, I got admitted to the Art Academy and then I was a designer and then I stopped. Why did I stop? Well, because it was not so creative anymore. But that doesn't mean I was not creative. I'm still very creative. Yeah. And this is a kind of me just like going around the corner and run a little bit. And, you know, mm. this is a need. I need to create it's something that is inside me. And if I don't do that, then I get burned out. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so. That's also, again, one of my advices that I talk. If you have a need that it comes from inside, if you don't listen to it, that's a big, big risk to get burnt out yeah. because your body is going to tell you, you're not listening to me. Now you're going to listen to me. Yeah. And, uh, and when you get older, it gets worse. So you have to listen to these needs. What is the need? You have to communicate visually. Okay, I'm a graphic designer. So <clears throat> what I do now is I, uh, well, I create all the visuals for my podcast. I like to communicate. So I interview people, I write, I create content. And, uh, and I want, of course, to make a living. So I also have now, a, uh, I'm following a course for more online marketing to be able to create more uh, um, income from, from it, from it all. Yeah. And uh, uh, so that's, what is going to be happening in the next years. Mm. And of course, burnout, escape from the burnout society is going to be uh, there. I'm going to go on and, and I want to plan my business so I have enough time for it. Uh, more guests, more uh, ideas, different ideas. And you know, <clears throat> I think I can have hundreds of episodes. And I would like to have an episode every week, but it doesn't succeed every week. No, but it's a lot of work also. To, it's a lot of work. To do it well. Yeah. Mm. But this content we, we are making on this, I mean, and it is for all the podcasters around. It's just like tiny little books, mm. like tiny little audio books. And they're there. That's a good thing about the new social media landscape. That's, I mean, what, what we create is always out there and it can be found by people on the other side of the planet. It was more difficult before. More, much so more this difficult. This is wonderful. I mean, I get, I get messages from people that I, I mean, from other countries. I mean, it's, I'm just surprised what this guy in, what do I know, in Spain has, has been listening to my podcast and has a question. It's interesting. Yeah, and it's it's wonderful that it can be like that. Yeah, it's encouraging, very encouraging. So uh, yeah, it's going to grow. I think it's going yeah. to be there. And uh, I also have one for my father now that he's. Uh, You're gonna do an episode with your father. Well, I think I'm going to interview him. Mm. Yeah, that's going to be good. Yeah, Excellent. and uh, yeah. he will. He's a very uh, experienced doctor. Yeah. Uh, only uh, well, we have to find out how we're going to do that in English. <laughs> His English uh, is yeah, not okay, what it was. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, and uh, well, or you can do it in Spanish, and then you have English subtitles. Subtitles, yeah, well, voiceover. Not a lot of job work, but it's doable. Yeah, it's doable. It's indeed doable. Yeah, but th- those are my plans, yeah. uh, and I think now I'm more again aligned with the things I like to do. Yeah. Um, so I think I'm not going to get burned out anymore because then I see the signs, <laughs> which are very important. And uh, 
And I see people around me and I see the signs in their own lives, like, okay, this is not going the, the, the way it should go. So I tell people, but yeah. they, do, they just don't listen, you know, no. they, they're not ready to listen. That's the thing. You have to be ready. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just a mind thing, an intellectual thing, and you have to feel it and yeah, be ready. Yeah. So where can people find your your you and your podcast me and my podcast that's www.escapeburnoutsociety.com escapeburnoutsociety.com yeah. okay gabriela guzman sanabria thank you so much for coming to the show come to mind the shift it's been a pleasure talking to you and good luck now with everything yeah thank you anders and it was uh, it was a pleasure and i'm so happy you were in amsterdam really to meet each other finally it was great to be able to do this in real life no, I haven't you. done it enough before, but now we did it. Thank you, Gabriela. If you like this video and other interviews and talks on Mind the Shift, please like, share, and subscribe. I appreciate all the support. Thank you.